It's been great. I've been retired for about a year and a half, visited 14 countries and some more than 100 different libraries during that period of time. Really, it have been addressing sort of trends that have taken place inside public libraries in North America and Europe and in many other types of places. So it's been a great sort of retirement. Uh, I do want to comment that anything that this presentation is on my website, which is just kroberts.ca. It'll also be on the Winnipeg Public Library website. And for the Winnipeg Public Library, I've written quite a lengthy paper that deals with trends and things that are happening, what libraries are doing right around the world. And that's going to be uh, posted on the Winnipeg Public Library website as part of this particular process. And we'll have everything I'm going to say in a lot more depth. Because I'm not going to talk for very long this morning, because this is just the launch of a, of a very lengthy process. And we want to hear from lots of people. But what I do want to do is to sort of show you a few things that really are going to be part of any library's future that, in fact, we're seeing in libraries right around the world. And the first one, I really, is e-books. And you have to talk about e-books anytime you're talking about the future of public libraries. Because what is happening right now in e-books is nothing in comparison to what is, is coming, what will be happening in the next few years. The whole publishing industry is changing rapidly. And what we are discovering is, is that the number of bookstores is disappearing, more and more people are buying books online, and that, for example, the typical Canadian print run for a, uh, a book used to be 7,000 copies. Now it's around 3,000 copies if it exists in print, and they need 5,000 copies to break even financially. So they have to move to electronic models. There aren't as many places that they can sell their books. So things like first novels, uh, literary fiction will only be done in electronic formats. They will not exist in print. So if anybody wants to read that type of book, they would have to read them in an electronic format. So certainly e-books are part of any library's future. There will always be print books. They will always be there. But increasingly, electronic books are going to be part of the library's future. And in fact, I'm doing a talk on that tonight on sort of the future of the book and what it may look like as a new art form. Because to an extent, when we talk about e-books, it's almost like talking about the horseless carriage. When the first sort of uh, automobiles came along, they weren't called automobiles. They called it a horseless carriage because they had to reference the past to sort of tell people what it was. It's a carriage, but it doesn't have a horse. Well, it's the same thing with e-books. It's a book, but it's electronic. And so we're at that sort of a stage. But the next generation of horseless carriage wasn't called a horseless carriage. It was an automobile because it started doing things differently. It could go faster. It had rubber tires. It had to have a windshield because it did go faster. You could put a radio in it. You could put a heater in it. And then suddenly it starts to change the way in which the car is viewed, where people can live farther from their workplace. They can take trips much, much further. So it begins to impact society. And the same thing will happen with books, that the next generation of books will, will still include reading, but they'll have other aspects and other elements to it that are not part of the printed book at the present time. And we can see that already. So one of the examples, and anybody who has a sort of smartphone or an iPad has probably used applications such as Skywalk. I love astronomy. When I was a kid, I used to try to read the astronomy books, most of them from the library. And I could never quite figure out what star was up in the sky or what constellation I could actually see, because the book didn't really know where I was. It was written generically for people that lived all over the world. But when you look at a, an application like Skywalk, all you have to do is point it to the sky through GPS. It knows where you are. And it can tell you exactly what star is up there. And it can tell you what constellation is up there. And then you can link to the actual descriptive information, the written information that is behind that particular uh, behind all of, of what it is that you're actually seeing. We're seeing that in other aspects. We're beginning to see medical books where and it, it, it updates itself. It gives you much more uh, recent medical information and can also be sorted by your age, your ethnicity, uh, by any type of health problems you might have, whether or not you're a smoker. And in, when you're putting that type of an information in, it will still give you the text, the books oriented text but it will be geared much more towards you as a human being and take into consideration who it is that's reading that particular book. So everything is going to change. The expectations of library customers is one that I put here because when something exists electronically, people accept the fact that a library has a limited amount of space for physical books, that there's only so many books that you can fit inside that library. 
But when it exists in the ether, when it's part of the internet, when it is just something that you can pull down, then the expectation is anything that I want to read, the library should be able to access it. Now, it's going to take time for us to get that world because of the contracts between publishers and authors, and many of them only deal with, sale, with sales. But we will probably get to a point where it's not so much about what the library is limited in by the number of books that exist inside the building, but what, what is out there and what is available. The other thing that we're seeing a lot of is that it used to be the books went out of print, but because of the electronic world, they don't really go out of print. They're still available in an electronic format. So it means that new authors are competing much more with favorite authors or somebody that you read a book and you really like it, so you want to see what else they've written. It used to be that if you wanted to see what else they've written, you couldn't because you could never find a copy of it. Now you can in that ebook world. So everything is going to change. Another change I think that is significant is that libraries have already made this shift from being places that are primarily centered around information. When I started as a librarian, by the way, when I started as a librarian, a good library circulated around six items per capita. Now a good library circulates 12 items per capita. So we are really busy. Many more people come through the doors and use this for other reasons. But when I started as a librarian, about 70% of the library's circulation was some form of nonfiction, some form of information that people were seeking. At the present time, in most urban libraries, nonfiction material, information based material, represents around 15 to 20% of the library's activity. So the other 80% is some form of imaginative work, some form of creativity. Something that feeds, such as Nereo is doing, that sense of imagination and creativity and sort of feeds the soul to a very great extent. And one of the things that has been a real influence on libraries is that discovery in Canadian society of fiction itself, where the amount of fiction that we read as Canadians has increased astronomically. So when libraries are thought of as being information places, we're still important information places. But we're not as important for that whole rank round realm of information. But in terms of imaginative works, the library is by far the primary place that people go to to receive that information. I'm a huge reader, but I cannot afford my own reading app without libraries. The other thing that's happening to libraries is that they're moving a shift from consumption. What I mean by consumption is you go to the library, you pick something out, and you take it home and you consume it at home, into being places of creation and creativity where the creation and the creativity is fostered within the library itself. This is a picture, by the way, of the Copenhagen Central Library. It's a wide section in one of the corridors, and they have musical instruments that are just there, electronic instruments, that uh, they're not booked. If one is free, you can put headphones on, you can start to play it. The woman in red is a very good keyboard player, and she was playing. The fellow who's a friend of mine, the fellow who's playing the guitar, is a good guitar player. He picked up the guitar and started playing. The two of them talked together and decided that they thought uh, what song they'd like to play together, and they both had the headphones on, flipped the switch so they could hear each other, and then began to play together. Nobody else could hear them inside the library. So that's something that's happening increasingly a lot in European libraries. Another shift is that from individual consumption, and again, that's where I take an item home, and, or I take it to the beach, and I take it someplace to read it, to a place where a lot in the same amount of space is used for collaboration. Where because libraries can have access to far better technology than exists inside of an individual home, then people can go there and use that technology collaboratively in order to create projects and work together. There's some great new technologies that are beginning to emerge so that school group projects, people can bring their computers or work with them, share their work, uh, view it on, top, on central computers, and pass that information back and forth and begin to use it. By the way, a lot of libraries are beginning to move into things such as video editing, sound editing, uh, green screens, so that they have those facilities for people to work in creativity in that way. The other shift that we're seeing is a real recognition that libraries need to have quality space. Uh, the, one of my favorite libraries is the one that's on the uh, well, it would be your right. That's in Sweden. It's the Malmo Sweden Library. It is absolutely stunningly beautiful. And what libraries have discovered is that when they have gorgeous spaces, the one on the other side of the way is Vancouver Public Library. And uh, when libraries have gorgeous space, it attracts more people. 
when you renovate a library and make it so that it's attractive, good-looking community space, where it's that community or neighborhood living room, then library use in that particular area goes up on average 40%. Same size space, renovated so that it looks more exciting, then it, the use goes up astronomically. The other thing that we're seeing in libraries is much more attention to a service orientation. I was recently in Europe and visited 23 libraries and did not at any time ever see a service point in which the staff member was on one side and the public was on the other. I could not see the screen. On each and every occasion in those libraries, the staff member and the member of the public was on the very same side looking at the same screen at the same time and going through the process of sort of looking at the information and deciding what they were seeing. The other thing that we did see is usually staff members would have three or four or five service locations in the area they were sort of uh, working in. So instead of going to over here to the desk, they would log in and log out and have much smaller work points, but be able to take the uh, members of the public to something that was close at hand, very close to them, so that they could use it. One thing that is, this is one of my library buildings, we did the first floor of this particular library. One thing that we are seeing is that people have a perception of libraries. They think of libraries as being books, books, books. But when libraries put in that creation space, when they put in a lot more Wi-Fi, when they have the computers, and they have those items that people are using, you want people to know what's inside that building. So strong street presence with those elements being shown to the street so that people can see what's going on inside that building attracts more people and changes the perception of the library from a place that is only about books to a place that is, really is the community living room to a great deal. One thing we did in this building is we did those sort of uh, the exciting lights that were on the outside of the building, and it was next to the uh, to Cops Coliseum, to the hockey arena in Hamilton. So we projected art onto the outside of the building so that local artists were projected at nighttime the art was projected on the outside of the building, and then when people went to hockey games or concerts and were leaving the hockey game and concert, then local art was being projected on the side of the library. So we've tried to make library space work for us even when the building itself was closed, and tried to make it so that people would go past the library and it wouldn't be a darkened shell, but instead it would be something that would sort of tell the jail when to go back downtown and see that building because it looks pretty exciting and interesting. Um, there's some other examples of it. This is probably one of my all-time favorite libraries. And yet the side of your downtown library is very similar to it. It's the Salt Lake City Library, designed by the same person who did the Vancouver Public Library. And what a sell on the street, where they really have emphasized everything that the library can do onto the street itself so that people, when they're passing by, can see what happens inside that building. And this is one of my favorite buildings, although it hasn't <coughs> opened yet. It's in uh, Arbus in, uh, in in Denmark, probably a community or a region you haven't heard of, there's 300,000 people in their building, a library building that's 300,000 square feet. And by the way, the three largest public sector projects that are going on in Europe at the present time are all libraries, Birmingham Public Library, which just opened, the Argus Public Library, which for 300,000 people is 180 million euros, and then the Helsinki Library, which is in the, down, uh, the design stages at the present time. And in Canada, it's much the same thing. The some of the largest building projects that are happening in the public sector are libraries. The Halifax Public Library, Central Library will open later this year, and the, the uh, uh, Calgary Public Library, which is in the design stages, is going to be close to over $200 million project. But one thing they've done in Argus is they've made it so there's a lot more programmable square footage space, where lots of the programs are actually being conducted by members of the community inside the space itself, by the way, this building is amazing. It also has it so that you can drive your car. They didn't want car parking lots to be part of it. You drive your car inside the library into a, heat, into a heated area, leave it, and then they have one of those machines that takes your car away on a conveyor belt and puts it underneath. So that when you're ready to leave, you go back and call up your car by code and it comes back up again. And then you leave from inside the library and, and go from that area. So I don't think we'll be seeing too many libraries that are quite as fancy as this one. America. But the uh, chief librarian of this one, Newt Schultz, came to Hamilton to look at our building. He loved the fact that we were projecting artwork onto the side of the building. So what they've done is that they built it to the nth degree. They're projecting artwork onto this massive big side of the building so that the community art 
and community happenings. And in fact, if you watch the Olympics, it's the Sochi Olympics, when they were doing the hockey games, they were using the LED lights in much the same way, so that you could see the flags of the countries they were competing and the score in the middle on the side of the building. So people are beginning to use the exteriors of the building to sell what is going on inside the building itself. I really believe that it's important for libraries, and it's interesting because I am on that expert panel on the future of libraries, and some people that do their submissions, and we've had hundreds of them, think that what a library does is it circulates material. So they keep saying, well, if, we, if we're not circulating as many books as you know, e-books are becoming more important, then maybe we can distribute lawnmowers, maybe we can distribute you know, seeds. But we're, that's not the activity. The activity is not circulating items. The activity that we're really involved in is that process of discovery and allowing people to reach self-discovery, no matter what format that might take. In the past, the primary format that we used in order to allow people to discover more about themselves, to explore ideas that they may be interested in, was circulating books, and it will continue to be an important component of it. But we have to explore other ways in which we're allowing people to self-explore ideas and thoughts that are important to them, that they determine themselves that they're interested in exploring. Because one of the unique things about a library, as opposed to an art gallery, for example, is that in an art gallery you go and you see a gallery of self-selected paintings that have been selected for you to look at. It's an installation, it's an exhibit. But in a library, you go and decide what it is that you're interested in discovering and what it is that you're interested in looking at. So I think that we have to decide, if we're about discovery and the process of discovery, what are the mechanisms that allow us to sort of enable every member of the community to discover more about themselves and to explore ideas that interest them? Thank you.